family and friends. Welcome to Alamo Heights Baptist Church live broadcast July 12th, 2020. I think it's the 12th yeah. of July. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure and a blessing to be able to stand before you guys and just be able to um, uh, listen and express God's word together. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 7 today, uh, verses 24 through 29. Um, I'll give you some time to turn there, and uh, as you are turning there, Matthew chapter 7, I uh, just want to remind you guys, if you guys have questions or comments um, as Bobby gets up and speaks today, that we are um, going to do our after service discussion again, um, live on Facebook, so give us a couple minutes after the sermon and then we'll come back on live and answer any questions or thoughts or comments that you guys might have. So if you get a chance, um, uh, Bob, as Bobby uh, brings the word today, um, if something springs into your mind and you have a thought or a question that you'd like to ask him, uh, we're going to do that after again. So um, if you got to watch that or you didn't get to watch that last week, it was kind of spare of the moment. And so if you want to go back and watch last week's, that'd be great. If you liked it or don't like it, let us know so we'll stop doing it um, or, or continue to do it. So, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 29. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless Bobby and uh, give him your words to speak to us today. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for another beautiful day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Um, thank you, Leighton. Um, thank you guys for being here today on Facebook. Um, whether you're watching now or you're going to watch later, or you're, it is later and you're now watching later. Uh, so glad that you're here, humbled um, and excited, anticipating the day that we can gather together in the actual building here at 6501 Broadway. But in the meantime, we're going to continue to uh, be on Facebook. We'll also post this video on uh, YouTube. Uh, so if you want to uh, attend again uh, later this week, you can, you can watch that. Um, thank you, Mike, who's helping us out today. Uh, with the video and Aries who came and, and, and worshipped along and helped lead worship. And so thank you guys so much. Um, again, as Leighton said, just, just if you're just jumping on on Facebook, let us know who you are, where you're watching from, who you're watching with, and, and we're grateful that you are here. Um, so uh, three weeks ago, I got a text message from, um, a, I have a couple of different group text message groupings that are uh, groupings of pastors and friends. And in this, somebody took a screenshot of a, um, I guess it was a tweet that went out by another pastor. This pastor, pastors a large church in a different state. And uh, this pastor was starting a new sermon series. And so uh, this friend of mine took a screenshot and sent it to a group of us and said, hey, what are your thoughts on this? And the quote that this pastor at this other church in a different state made uh, was this. Becoming a Christian is easy. It won't cost you anything. Jesus never invited anyone to become a Christian. He invited us to become his follower. I'm going to read it again. Just uh, slow it down a bit. Because um, at the moment that I read it for the first time, I thought, huh, I kind of just wrote it off. I didn't think anything of it. But then it started really percolating inside of me that I kind of felt uncomfortable with the statement. So I'm going to read it again. Becoming a Christian is easy. It won't cost you anything. Jesus never invited anyone to become a Christian. He invited us to follow. I 
I don't know how that quote sits with you, or maybe, it, like you, it's going to take a week or so uh, for it to kind of really sink in that you don't like this quote, that you were uneasy about this statement, or you kind of like this statement. Uh, the truth is, I'm kind of torn. I'm on both sides. I really like the, um, the, the shock value that this statement gives. It's a lot like uh, somebody putting on their church sign, a pastor putting on their church sign, a building for sale or not build, the church is not a building or we're leaving because you'll get a bunch of emails like a pastor I know or I myself have experienced. Some of you sent those emails to me. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of shock value to this. It's that idea that becoming a Christian costs you absolutely nothing. And at first you might take offense to that thinking, well, absolutely cost me something. But the truth is, is if you're really honest, professing that you are a Christian, maybe praying a prayer in a pew of a church absolutely costs you nothing. Your heart and your mind being uh, pulled and tugged to this affection for Jesus that you now believe and you confessed with your mouth and you believed with your heart and you prayed a prayer. And a lot of us are in that. If you grew up in, in the faith, if you grew up in the church, that may be where you're familiar with that profession of faith. And maybe you followed your profession of faith by having believers' baptism and came to a, a baptismal a lot like ours where in a church service or after a church service you came and you were baptized uh, uh, in the likeness of Christ. You were buried in the likeness of his death and raised to life in the likeness of his resurrection. And those are absolutely two massively important decisions that you can make. They are very important to the foundation. Uh, it is your faith and my faith. But if you really think about it, how much did that cost you in your life? I watched the sermon. Uh, this was a tease for the sermon that this pastor was preaching. And I, I watched the sermon. Actually, they posted it early uh, because they too are doing uh, church online. And it was posted early in the morning, that Sunday morning. And I, I listened to it first thing as I woke up that morning. And I text that group of pastors. It's not such a controversial statement because he followed it up that Jesus never, never called his followers Christians. And if you look into this, and we're going to look into this today, that it's absolutely, absolutely three times that the word Christian pops up into the New Testament. And it wasn't by believers calling themselves or disciples calling themselves Christians, but they were non-believers, non-Christians, non-followers of Jesus that looked at the followers of Jesus or the followers of the way and identified them as Christians. Which we say often, or I say often, it just means Christ-like. People who look like Christ. People who are operating like Jesus Christ operated when He was on this earth. And, and so the first place that this pops up is in Acts chapter 11. Um, you don't have to turn there if you're taking notes. Uh, just take notes of Acts chapter 11 verses 19 through 26. And if you do want to turn there, that's where I'm going to read. It's the first place that the word Christian pops up, and it's in uh, the city of Antioch. It says this in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So what's happening here in the context of the world in this uh, I, this space here where Luke is taking note is, of what's happening is uh, Stephen is one of the followers of Jesus. He's one of the uh, uh, apostles or one of the disciples, the followers. And he preaches a gospel message. He tells the world or those that are listening to him about Jesus. And those that were listening to him take him out after this and they stone him and they kill him. And so all of the believers, or those that came to believe, they scatter, they run away because they don't want their lives taken too. 
Verse 20 uh, says that some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch and they began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. And watch this. A great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 22 says, News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And so the church of Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch, another, another apostle, another uh, commissioned official of the church was sent to Antioch from Jerusalem. Now Barnabas' name means the encourager, so of course they're going to send Barnabas from Jerusalem to Antioch to encourage this new group of people meeting together as the church in Antioch. Verse 24 says, He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great number of the people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he saw Saul, when he found Saul, he brought him to Antioch also. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church in Antioch and taught a great number of people. And then here it is, Acts 11, verse 26. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. It's amazing if you look at the context of what's happening here because it's so relevant to you and to me today. And that's why I wanted to take a moment before we jump back to where Leighton read out of Matthew. It's important to see what is going on here. Followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, now that he has ascended back to heaven, the church is springing up everywhere, and not a physical building springing up everywhere, but rather groups of people giving their hearts and their minds, stirring with affection for their Savior and their Messiah, Jesus, are beginning to encourage one another, meeting with one another at various places, at the temple, by the river, in homes, in the marketplace, gathering together together. And they're doing two things that I want to point out here out of Acts chapter 11. And the first is this. They are expressing, reading, and sharing the gospel message to one another. See, you and I take for granted the fact that we have a physical Bible bound in many different translations and many different variations and various shapes and sizes and um, we even have apps for our mobile devices so that we would have scripture in front of us there is the dwell app that you could even listen to it in like hundreds of different voices articulated to you all day long with a subscription we take for granted that we are having the bible so accessible and easily accessible to us today in our modern day but does it affect us and when we share the gospel message to one another in the way that it did in the life of this new church springing up all over the place as people are scattered throughout the known world? Uh, last week I expressed to you that I wanted, to, I wanted us to take the, the, the July challenge. And the July challenge said every day we're going to walk a mile. And in walking a mile for seven straight days we're going to look at the seven I am statements of God. Now, whether you did or did not do that this week, the I am statements of God absolutely spur and change something inside of us. I am the resurrection and the life awakens or should awaken our hearts to a new life, a new day in Christ. Knowing that yesterday's troubles are cleared up and affected by His new mercies day in and day out. Does it mean that trouble or, or, or worries or anxieties cease to exist, but rather we now can rest in God's hope being that He is the resurrection and the life. That He is the bread of life, sustaining the hunger inside our souls for something more that the world can never meet. That He is the door and the shepherd leading us. Knowing that in this world there are those that want to devour and consume us. That there is sin that so easily entangles us. And that He is the shepherd leading us to a greener pasture. 
That he is the good shepherd finding us when we are broken and hurt and lost, bringing him to himself. I am the light of the world in a world that is dark, hopeless, that he brings light to illuminate and a light that we get to possess, that we get to shine like stars in a dark and crooked generation. And so I hope you entered into that challenge. And I told you that last week that the best part of that challenge is now you get to run back like those from Emmaus to Jerusalem, that you get to run back and to tell your family and friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your classmates about the good news, the gospel message that is Jesus Christ. That's what they're doing in Antioch. That's what they're doing scattered all about in the known world. They are sharing the good news, the gospel message. And every time that we read in Acts, Luke points out for you and for me that when the good news is preached, many come to know Jesus and believe. Church does not have to be so hard. We make it so difficult as we gather in buildings, as we try to figure out the programming that happens in buildings. We make it way too hard. It is quite simple. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Share His love, His forgiveness, His mercy, the hope that is found in Him. And many lives will be changed. Many will come to know Him. As I pointed out last week, Romans 8, it is riddled with, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. Imagine if we preach that day in and day out to our kids, our spouses, our neighbors, our communities. Imagine what that world would look like. That's the first thing that is happening here in Antioch. And the second thing is this. If you took an aerial view, if you and I were there, and if you had one of those drones with the camera, and you can uh, elevate it up into the city of Antioch, looking down, you would see that there, it is compartmentalized. There is this Greek sect over here. There is this Jewish sect over here. Maybe there's this other group of people over here. It was extremely diverse, but even in Antioch's diversity, it was broken up into sections where uh, different people groups didn't associate with other people groups because they were different. So even in its diversity, there was these races and people groups that weren't intermixing with one another. You know, maybe there were some here and there, but for the most part, everybody kept to themselves, especially those religious. They did not want to intermingle or intersect with other and different people groups, especially those that didn't believe in the law or didn't believe in Jesus. And so what the believers begin to do in preaching the good news is they begin tearing down some of those walls Um, If if we go, uh, turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter uh, 5, 6, and 7. We'll come back to Acts chapter 11. But it's important to see really what was going on. And and the movement that was being led by Jesus' followers is because of what Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. You see, Jesus shows up unto the scene. And in Matthew chapter 4, we find that he calls his first disciples. Take note that he doesn't say, hey, would you become a Christian in Matthew chapter 4? But rather, he finds fishermen, everyday, ordinary, uneducated men, and says, hey, come follow me. Now, that is my paraphrased version from Matthew chapter 4, so I'm going to need you to go read it back your own this week. But in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus sets the scene as he comes on and he finds local fishermen, everyday, ordinary, uneducated fishermen. It says, hey, drop your nets and follow me. They go find other fishermen, like-minded. Hey, come follow this man. Jesus, over and over again, finds these individuals some broken, some hurting, some who were thought as of scum, like the tax collector. 
It says, hey, drop everything and follow me. I know our women's ministry, we're looking at the cost of following Jesus this last week. And Jesus in this moment says, uh, um, hey, I don't want you to go back to your family. Don't worry about them right now. Don't worry about what you have to put in order. We are people of order. We like to have a plan. And Jesus obliterates that and says, hey, forget your plan. Just come follow me. Find yourself in close proximity to me. Jesus, in his uh, famous sermon, we call it the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Look at what it says in verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and he sat down. And his disciples, what? If you're reading in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, what does it say about his disciples? They came to him and he began to teach them. Again, a very simple an easy model for us today. A disciple is somebody who follows a leader, a teacher. You and I have the opportunity today to follow Jesus. Now, he's not here physically in front of us and, and walking up and down Broadway that we may follow him. But no, we have his word so accessible to us that as Disciples as followers, we take time, just like they did on the hillside, to come near to Him, to draw near to Him in His Word, so that He may teach us. And, and, and I'm not going to read all of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, but I'm going to make note of a few things that Jesus begins to teach Him. You are the salt of the earth. Don't lose your saltiness because when you lose your saltiness, you are no longer good. You are the light of the world. A light, it would make no sense to hide a light under a basket. No, no, you would put a light on a stand so that others would see the light and feel the warmth of the light, to be directed by the light. He, he says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. No, no, no. The law that was given from Moses and the prophets and, and all the law that you've adhered to and that you've memorized. No, no, I didn't come to abolish that. I came to fulfill it. And so much so, you've heard it said. Jesus says it over and over again. You've heard it said. He takes the law. He takes the precepts. He takes the commandments and says, you've heard it said. And then he takes it a step further. But I say don't just love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind and love yourself. No, 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 no. I want you to also love your neighbor as I have loved you. There were these other laws. There's, um, um, you were allowed in the first century to walk up to somebody and slap them in the face. Like if you had a disagreement with somebody and you wanted to make it known to them that you did not agree and you wanted to just um, um, deface them, I mean, you literally slap their face. We, no, we shouldn't try that. Like don't go around and slapping people this week. You might get into trouble. But that was the case for them. And Jesus says, hey, if somebody comes to slap your face, Turn the cheek and say, can you do it again on this side? Uh, there was another written and unwritten law that said, if a Roman soldier came up to you who had a pack, it was their choice that they could come up to you and say, hey, I need you to carry this pack. And by law, you had to carry it at least up to a mile. And so Jesus said, hey, if this happens to you, carry it two miles. And if someone takes you to court for your shirt, I want you to concede and say, here's my jacket and here are my pants. Here are my socks and my shoes. Take it a step further, Jesus says. Jesus comes and in this sermon as his disciples are leaning in and listening. And as we read, Jesus in these words is saying, hey, I want you to take it to the next level in following me. I don't want you to just take this law and live by the law, but I want you to push further, to be people who love more, give more. 
Leighton read it to us at the end, and, and by no means am I giving the Sermon on the Mount any credit because I'm, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to let you read and lean into it on your own. Maybe we'll come back to it at some point. But then, as Leighton read in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus sums it all up saying, Hey, if you have ears, which was everybody listening there, good ears and bad ears, everyone had ears. If you have ears to hear, then put these words into practice. And, and, and you've studied this, you've heard this, you know it, right? For those that put it into practice, you are wise. And when the storms come, when the, when the waves hit, when the winds hit, you will stand because of the words that you've put into practice. Jesus' words that you've put into practice. But you are fools if you don't put it into practice because the storms, they do come. The waves, they do come. The wind, it does come. And it beats against the house that is our lives. And if we are foolish, we will fall every time. Jesus' words are profound. And, and the truth is, is you and I, as followers, just like those in Acts who are followers, they could have heard Jesus' words, we could hear Jesus' words, and do nothing with it. And we would be fools. And nobody would recognize any difference in us. And maybe, just maybe, that's wrong with the world today, is nobody recognizes anything in us. And that's why this statement, as I got this text message, began to boil inside of me, thinking to myself, maybe I've only accepted myself to be a Christian, and nothing is recognizable in me. I only see it for myself. Professing to be a Christian. It stings a bit, I know. I've been dealing with it for three weeks. But may we, in these next few moments that we have left, take it to the next step. You see, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 8, does two things. And I know I'm, I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you today. But before we get back to Acts 11, before we get back to Antioch, Jesus set the example by what happens in Matthew chapter 8. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it just a quick paraphrase, paraphrase. But the first thing that he does is there's this leper that comes up to him and, and says, Master, teacher, if you are willing, will you heal me? Jesus just gave this beautifully articulate sermon at the Sermon on the Mount. And he, too, could have just left it as a sermon. As any good pastor, preparing for a sermon, could have just left it at the sermon. But Jesus didn't leave it just as a sermon. He stepped in and close to this leper, who was unclean, who nobody wanted to get near. Jesus comes near and heals him. He began to put into motion and into practice what he just preached and the second thing he did, and this one was even more profound than the leper, a Roman centurion. A, a Roman centurion, somebody who was despised and hated by the Jews, sends, gets near to Jesus and says, Hey, um, Jesus, you are a man of, of authority and my servant is ill. I need you to heal him. And Jesus says, Well, take me to him. And the Roman centurion said, No, 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 no. Because you are a man of authority, as I am a man of authority, as a Roman centurion, just say the word, Jesus. Just say the word, and I believe that he will be healed. Jesus, in this moment, says the word. Points out the faith of this wicked Roman centurion in the eyes of the Jews, in the eyes of the religious. And it was so. Right after the Sermon of the Mount, we miss this so many times because we want to get to the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. We want to memorize. We want to highlight. We want to, uh, in our Bible studies, have conversations about the Sermon on the, on the Mount. But we forget the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 8, Jesus puts into practice what he just 
preached. And so um, on this July 12th at 1113, would we not just read God's word, but in a moment as I close us in prayer, would we begin to put it into practice? This is what's going on in the Antioch city. You see, Jesus' followers, people who follow Jesus and are having conversations of the gospel message, the good news of Jesus, sharing with one another, loving, forgiving, taking a next step further in their serve and in the way they invite people over to their house and the way that they're uh, tearing down the racial walls in Antioch tearing down the way things are operating, just like Jesus did, flipping the world upside down. The non-believers and the leaders in Antioch begin to see that there's something different in these people. And what was different in these people? It was that Jesus was leading them and they were following, even though he wasn't there anymore. And they were spurring and encouraging one another on. So much so that the leaders in Jerusalem sent the encourager. Like out of, out of all of the encouragers in the whole world, the number one encourager, Barnabas, came to Antioch. And then encouraged himself, he calls for Paul to come to Antioch. And for two years they spend time spurring one another on, teaching more, discipling, leading, drawing more in follow after Jesus. And the non-believers, the leaders in Antioch, saw this taking place, saw the effect of Jesus healing and mending relationships, saw the effect of of people turning their cheek and getting another hit, Uh, uh, giving clothes, not just shirts, but jackets and pants and undergarments and socks and shoes and everything they were sharing with one another. They were sharing and breaking bread in their homes together. They were carrying the packs of centurions, not just one mile, but two miles, maybe three miles, four miles. This was changing the face of Antioch, so much so that the leaders of Antioch needed to call it something. They needed to put identification with this group of people because it was no longer just Jews, but it was Greeks and it was Gentiles and it was people from all over the place. What do we call it? So for the first time in the history of the world, let's call it Christians, Christianity. These people who look like Christ. You see... It isn't that the title of Christian that costs us anything. But it's the attitude of Christ that changes everything. Operating like Jesus in your everyday and in my everyday is asking a whole lot from you and from me. Because it calls us to be humble. It calls us not to just think of ourselves anymore. It it calls us not to just think about our spouse or our kids or the people that we live with in our household. But it calls us to think about our neighbors, even the ones we don't like, even the ones that may have hit us in the cheek, the ones that we've carried the packs for. You see, it calls us to think about those that we work with or those that we go to school with or those that we see on the streets that are broken and hurting. It calls us, even in the racial tension that we see and hear and feel and face today, it calls us to think differently, to absolutely tear down walls. To listen in a way that we've never listened. Because we're too busy talking, but now we listen. And we're slow to speak. It calls us as a church to 
not operate in the confines of the four walls because we can't gather in this place, but rather because of the safety of others, we, we humble ourselves enough to, to share a word, a text message, an email, a phone call, to share the good news. Friends, this, as followers of Jesus, costs us everything. This, in operating like this, forever, I believe with my whole heart, forever changes the world. And so, um, may we go now. May we not just read what we've just read. May we not just hear or have heard what we've just read. But would we take that and now operate? Would we take that and now serve and love and forgive so well that they, people, the people around us would not see us anymore, but they would see Jesus. And that in seeing Jesus, they would see their creator, God. And would they too forever be changed? We're going to continue to dive into this as we uh, continue our Sundays on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or whatever it looks like. But I encourage you and me to, to pray these hard prayers. That we would not be so just in tradition that we profess to be Christians, but rather would we lean so much in more to our Creator and the fact that He sent Jesus for us to be commissioned to change the world around us as His followers. So may we go now in His grace and in His peace. Pray with me. Father God. God, what a difficult conversation it is to have with ourselves and have with our church friends, to have with our family members, to uh, lean into this idea of, of who is it that we are in you, Jesus. And so like that group of people came to you on the mountainside looking for a leader, as a group of followers, God, we look to you, Jesus. And so lead us, take us, Show us, give us ears to hear, and would we be wise enough to put it into practice? Would we go now? God, the families watching, the moms, the dads, the kids, the neighbors, the coworkers, the classmates watching, that we would go now and be you to the context that you've given us. Would we love? Would we forgive? Would we share? Would we serve? Give us a courage and a boldness to do this because we know that we are so weak that we cannot do it on our own, God. So, God, we need you. And again, we ask for you to heal the sick. God, we ask to protect from this virus. God, we ask to protect jobs, to protect finances, to, to God, to just, to just show up in so many ways as we lean into you, the author, the perfecter of our faith. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Friends, it's good to see you on Facebook again today. Um, again, I think we're going to see you here shortly. And so know that we love you. We care for you. We'll see you soon. Have a great week.